I think that if the reader can know the true story in the background, that it changes the reading. And I think it changes the reading for the better because I think that there's something that happens in writing, that there's an actual act of transformation that, that occurs on the page in the writing. When I was writing about my father's suicide, I worked on the book for 10 years and I didn't know how to write about it. And I wrote too literally at first. I wrote about the day we found out he died and so we're all crying and, and it's impossible to read. Uh, but then I was writing the, the short novel that's in the middle of the book and halfway through there's an enormous surprise where everything changes. And I didn't see that moment coming until I was halfway through writing the sentence. And so the next day I went back and I planned to cut that and continue with my plan. But I reread all the pages leading up to that moment and it was like seeing them for the first time. Even though I wrote them, I, f I saw all this pattern in them for the first time that was leading to that moment that I hadn't seen. And that changed everything for what I thought about writing. And, and the best pages of the book are, are right after that, where it's crazy and I have no plan. And so my feeling about telling an audience about the background of the story is that there's nothing to hide. It's, it's, I want an audience to know that my father did commit suicide when I was 13. I want them to know that he asked me to come spend, spend a year back in Alaska with him, and I said no, and soon after is when he killed himself. Because when I was writing this tale of a boy and his father going homesteading for a year, that was a second chance to say yes to my father, to spend that year with him, and I didn't understand that when I was writing. It never occurred to me when I was writing that I was getting a second chance to go spend that year with him. And so there's something powerful, I think, that happens in fiction at an unconscious level where there's all this pattern. And I think that you can only really see that if you know what the true story is in the background. And so I'm always happy to, to, to say exactly what's true and not true in the books because I'm very interested in, in what the fiction has made out of those past events. I think there's something in our unconscious that wants to take the very ugly events and wants to turn them into something beautiful, wants to reshape them, wants to have a kind of redemption. I thought that I would, that this book would be how I would get closer to his despair and I would finally understand him and I would understand the final moments and that's what I was trying to do because I felt I had been cowardly in all of my other short stories about him, that they were pretty but they were cowardly, they didn't get close to that despair. So I thought this would be a novel that by the end would follow right into his final moments, into the point where he kills himself, and that I would understand it better when I got there. But halfway through, the boy kills himself. He, the father hands him the gun, because the father's suicidal. The boy looks down at it, and I realized right then, he's just gonna put up, up to his head and fire. And there's no thought whatsoever. And it was only years afterward that I could try to understand that moment. And what, what happened, you know, it, and I could see that partly it was revenge, that partly it was a psychological revenge, that all these years I've had to carry around my father's suicide. So in the book, the boy kills himself, and the, the father has to literally carry the boy's body all around from one island to the next <laughs> island. So I made him carry my body around for a while. And, and I, of course, was completely unaware of that, but it took a few years later to understand that, that partly that was revenge. In the two books, in Legend of a Suicide, the primary relationship is a father and son, and the boy is the main character, really. In the next one, Caribou Island, it's a marriage, and Irene is the main character. But the antagonists, the boy's father and Gary, Irene's husband, you're right, are very similar in the kind of pressure that they put on Irene and the boy. And that acts out in different ways in the books. Uh, but they both have a sense that if they go back into wilderness and they go back into nature, that they'll find some better self and that they'll find a way for the boy's father, he believes he'll be able to run away from his problems, that his despair will vanish. He'll find a way out of that despair and his despair with women in particular, the second marriage that he's broken up through infidelity like the first and that he wants back. And Gary has a little bit different dream, which is that he's never actually, he's always felt alone and so he married and had kids, but he actually wanted to be alone also. And he believes that this cabin is, will be the better shape of himself. It will be the outward shape of a man. And that he'll connect outward sort of endlessly into nature. This is a dream that comes from the British Romantic poets through the American Transcendentalists. A dream that, that our imagination with a capital I connects to nature with a capital N. That they're actually the same faculty. And then we'll find our innocence, our child self, when we go back. 
I don't actually believe this. I, I think that when we go into nature, we just find a mirror, and it's a mirror that amplifies. So if what's happening inside of us is terrifying, what we find in nature is even more terrifying. It, it's amplified back. So I don't have the dream anymore. I can't believe it. But the funny thing is, my life is still arranged so that I'm constantly going for the dream. I, I live in New Zealand on a ridge overlooking the ocean and hills, and I go hiking and go windsurfing and, and spend part of the rest of the year on a boat in Turkey along the coast in beautiful little coves. And so I'm constantly seeking out a kind of solace and comfort in nature, and a lot of it, a lot of time spent by myself there. And yet I don't believe the dream at all. I had a dream for a long time that I'd be some sort of mountain man, that I would head off into the hills and I would live out in a cabin and all that. And, and I loved backpacking and such, but what I realized after a while is that I can't really be alone for more than two or three days. And then I just start to feel so lonely and I, I need other people and I'm just not cut out for it. I, I can't really be the, the kind of loner out, out in nature. And, I did actually build a boat to sail nonstop solo around the world, which is going to be five months alone. And I was committed to it, and I had all the food on board and everything, but the crossbeams weren't strong enough in between the hulls, and so I had to turn back. Uh -huh. So I had planned to set out, but I have to admit that although I felt some excitement about it, and I love sailing, what I felt mostly was despair and dread. The idea of being alone for that long actually was uh, something that felt terribly wrong. My writing's very unconscious, and my life has been led very unconsciously, too. And I've had repetitive disasters. I have an ability to repeat the same mistake two or three times. And, and partly it's because of not having any idea why I'm really doing what I'm doing. So I went to sea for years as a captain when I couldn't get Legend of a Suicide published. I couldn't get published for 12 years. And so I went to sea and became a captain on sailboats. And I was repeating my father's life. He was a dentist who didn't like being a dentist, so he went to sea. He became a commercial fisherman in Alaska. And he loved it, but it was also disastrous for him. It didn't work out in the end. And so when I went to sea, I was repeating his life, but I wasn't really aware of that when I was doing it. So I've, I've sort of lived the method, you know. I've, I've gone out there unconsciously and experienced the disasters and train wrecks, just like my characters do in the, in the novels. What I like about writing is it feels like a religious practice to me where it's every morning, just a couple hours, and it's a time of, of meditation in a way, of reading through the 20 or 30 pages up to the point where I'm going to add a new page. Then, uh, for the next hour, it just comes in kind of brief, like quick flashes, the, my page or two for that day. And there's a kind of immersion in that and a kind of unconsciousness. And it, uh, although I'm an atheist and I, I don't have any religious beliefs, I feel like Writing satisfies that desire that, that we have, I think that we probably all have some need or desire for something like religion. Uh, so it, it's, been, uh, it's been tremendously satisfying in that way. I'm not thinking about what the shape of the sentences will be when I'm actually writing them. They just come very quickly and I type as fast as I can think. So it's very fast. And the books are published the way that they came out in the first draft. So I don't think about it then, but I actually study language every day. I've been uh, translating Beowulf every day from Old English, uh, seeing that part of our language, the old part from a thousand years ago before it was combined with French. And uh, so I'm thinking about uh, meter and syntax in, in my teaching also. I, I have, uh, teach from linguistics and the history of the English language when I'm teaching style in, in fiction. So I think about it a lot, but when I'm actually writing, I don't think about it, but to me it's very rhythmic. I mean, the, the whole the text is put together through vision of uh, landscape and through a rhythm in the prose. And, and that's what I'm looking for, and that's why I read through the previous 20 pages before I start to write, is so that I'll feel that, that rhythm to it. Well, writing is really therapeutic. Uh, it has to be more than therapy. Writing and therapy are both about truth, but writing is also about the beautiful. It also has an aesthetic goal that therapy doesn't have. And writing that doesn't have that aesthetic goal is just crap. It's just therapy. And not to say that therapy isn't valuable, but, but, uh, but yeah, it doesn't have that, that artistic or aesthetic aim. So one thing that I was surprised by in spending all these years thinking about my father and writing about him is to realize that I don't really understand the final moments of his suicide any better than I ever did right from the beginning. I understand all the patterns in his life and what led to suicide becoming possible, what could have put him to that final moment, but then I can never make it inevitable. I can never say, oh, this is why he had to do it. 
he always could have, at the last moment, he always could have decided not to. And I can never erase that. I can never get rid of that. I also wrote a book about a school shooting, a mass murder. I profiled him. And I had access to all of his mental health history, all of his emails, everything, 1,500 pages of files. And even with all that information, I could not get to, make, to the point where I could make his shooting and suicide inevitable either. I could see where it was possible. There are half a dozen narratives leading to that moment, but I could not get it to where he had to do it. He could have not done it at the end. And that's interesting to me that in fiction, there's a kind of open-endedness. We can't ever actually make it to where our character had to do the final act that they do. We can only get close to where it becomes plausible, where we can see that it, that it makes sense, that it could have gone that way.